So good afternoon. I'm Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Contracts. We're here today to discuss the New York City Human Service Contract Workers' Wages and to determine if they are a living wage. The city relies on human service workers, human services workers, to provide essential assistance to many vulnerable New Yorkers, ranging from job training and placement to early childhood education, services for seniors, people with disabilities, and patients at community health centers. There are 17,613 human service contracts, uh, and I'm happy to be corrected if, if some of this is not accurate. Uh, located in, this is just not possible, 117 city agencies. Um, so you'll, you'll get us the information about how many contracts, how many agencies, and the total value. It's a lot. It's a lot. The human service sector also employs a significant proportion of uh, New Yorkers. In 2011, human service industry jobs accounted for 40% of all occupations in the Bronx alone. Unfortunately, over half of human service uh, services workers, the majority of whom are uh, women and people of color, who provide these vital services to our communities earn less than $14 an hour. Frankly, it's troubling that many human service workers, due to their low income, are eligible for the same services they provide in their professions, such as food stamps and homeless shelters. However, the Council and Mayor de Blasio have made steps toward trying to improve wages for these workers. In 2002, the Council passed the Living Wage Law requiring city service contractors and subcontractors who provide home care, daycare, head, head Start services, and services to people with cerebral palsy to pay their workers a living wage. And we're interested to see the controller's uh, review of that of those of those contracts. Most recently, the mayor's uh, fiscal year 2016 budget allocates nearly $59 million to establish a 2.5% COLA and an 11.50 per hour wage floor for human service contract workers. This is the first time in seven years that human services contract workers have received a cost of living adjustment or a wage increase from the city. As many of us at the council would agree this is well overdue and we appreciate the mayor's taking the first steps to rectify the situation. The budget increase reflects new mayoral support for the human services sector. However, many of us hope that this increase will be just the first step toward an additional funding for human service contract workers to get paid at least $15 an hour with annual COLA adjustments tied possibly to DC 37 wage increases. We're here today to explore how the Council can facilitate increased wages for human service contract workers so they can meet the growing costs of living and working in New York City. We will also discuss the administration's progress in allocating the funds to agencies so they can pass along the wage increases to the human service contract workers, as well as hearing about the career ladder program that they envision. Thank you in advance to the administration, the Human Services Council, the human service contract providers who are here and other interested parties for attending this hearing and providing substantive testimony that is important to understanding the issue at hand. And now I'm very pleased to introduce Council Member Arroyo, Chairwoman for the Committee on Community Development, who will give an opening statement and I'm very pleased to be sharing this committee hearing with her. Thank you, my co-chair, uh, council member, uh, and thank you all for being here. My name is Maria del Carmen Arroyo, and I chair the Committee on Community Development. And I would also like to thank all of my other colleagues who have joined us and will join us uh, to come together for this hearing today. Uh, the Committee on Community Development shares many of the concerns raised by Chair Rosenthal. And we would also like to thank the Center for Women's Welfare and the United Way for putting together a report, uh, the report on self-sufficiency standards that ultimately served as the basis for this hearing today. So thank you for that work. I promised you sometime in the spring that we would have this conversation today. Here we are. Um, 
when I was approached by the United Way uh, several months ago, I was appalled to learn that many of the workers on city human service contracts are not paid to what amounts to be a living wage. And in our budget hearings in May, um, I was very adamant about the fact that we cannot contribute to poverty wages in our city through the services that we purchase and for the services that we provide to our residents. We do recognize that the city can be an expensive place to live, but that government should not contribute to the problem of being the largest provider of poverty wages in the city, as I stated before. Both of these committees are aware of the state law that restrains uh, city contracting, and we're not here to debate that law with the administration. Um, our goal today is to hopefully begin to, to think outside the box and try to collaborate in developing contracting programs to ensure that workers hired for city projects do not need to take on a second job or apply for food stamps or um, low-income housing. In particular, we would like to hear specifics from the administration on the city's, first on the city's implementation of Hire NYC and its impact on human service contracts, uh, workers, and the administration's progress towards establishing the 1150 per hour wage floor for human service workers, and lastly, whether nonprofits, worker cooperatives, and other alternative business models can receive special consideration for city contracts in order to reduce worker exploitation. We hope this hearing will serve as an opportunity for the council and the administration to work towards providing sustainable wages for workers employed through our city's contracts. I want to thank my committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Alex Polinov, the council to the committee to my right. Uh, Jose Conde, who's somewhere in the corner. Uh, the policy analyst and Jessica Dawson, uh, our fiscal analyst. And now I turn it over to my co-chair and thank you for joining us for this conversation. Thank you, Councilmember Arroyo. I also want to acknowledge the council members in the room. We have Councilmember oh, Wills, uh, Palma, King, uh, Ku, Constantinides, and Mizell, and I also want to thank my general counsel, Alicia Brown, and my staff, Sarah Mallory, who helped us to prepare today. Now we have, it's my understanding, we have from uh, primarily OMB, we have Simonia Brown, hi, PV Anantram, Allison Brick, Hi, and also Laura Ringelheim from the Mayor's Office of Contracts. Welcome, thank you for coming here, and I'll turn over the testimony to you. Um, I, th I think I'm lost technologically. Oh, this no, works, no, perfect, no, thank you. <laughs> used to be you had to press a button for that a long time ago. Thank you again. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to testify here today. Um, good afternoon, Chair Arroyo and Chair Rosenthal. I am PV Anantram, Deputy Director at the New York City Office of Management and Budget, and it is my pleasure to speak to you today at this oversight hearing on self-sufficiency standards for workers in human service contracts. My testimony today will provide information regarding the de Blasio administration's human service provider wage adjustments and corresponding implementation by the applicable city agencies. For most of the last decade, client service providers working under contract with city agencies have asked for increased funding to reimburse them for the increased wages for their employees. These dedicated professionals work in programs that the city and its residents rely on each day for essential services in the areas of aging, safety, education, health, housing, and youth development. They care for and provide safety net services to some of the city's most vulnerable populations. <clears throat> the administration heard their pleas and made a major commitment to addressing the situation. The mayor's 2016 executive budget provided $54 million for a 1150 or 2.5% cost of living wage adjustment. 
and we want to thank the City Council for their support in this effort. This wage adjustment will affect more than 50,000 employees working for nonprofit agencies providing vital services for the City of New York through direct client service contracts with ACS, DIFTA, the Department of Corrections, DOE, DOHMH, the Department, Department of Probations, Youth Services, HPD, HRA, the Criminal Justice Coordinator's Office, and Small Business Services. Sig significant, significant effort was undertaken to ensure that we captured all eligible employees, and as a result, more programs and providers are receiving this adjustment than were eligible in 2008, the last time the adjustment was given by the city. This is a long and overdue step in the support of employees doing important social work. Um, over the course of three months, the department worked, the, this administration worked with stakeholder organizations to develop a streamlined process for implementation of this wage adjustment. This was a significant undertaking involving rigorous technical, legal, administrative, and internal communication coordinating between the 11 affected agencies which oversee more than 4,000 eligible contracts. And I have to say the number of contracts differ every time the definition changes, with more than 800 eligible providers, altogether representing more than 50,000 employees. Perhaps most importantly, given the complex nature of implementation, providers can make the wage increase retroactive to July 2015 for all impacted employees. Considerable efforts were undertaken to ensure that an efficient and effective process would be put in place so that every single eligible vendor is able to obtain the funding from the city for the wage increase for their employees and that every single eligible employee can take advantage of the adjustment. <clears throat> Implementing this wage adjustment requires every eligible provider to amend its existing contract with the city. This is an enormous endeavor for the city and its providers. As a result of the comprehensive and intensive development process the city undertook, city agencies and providers will work off a new standardized two-page contract amendment that will work for every single one of the different arrangements providers have with the city. As part of this process, providers are required to submit documentation of their eligible employees' payroll data. This, this information will allow the city to accurately budget for a wage adjustments, reflect the numbers in the new contracts, and submit those contracts for the, to the controller for prompt approval. Recognizing that this reporting requirement places a new burden on providers, the city has created a template for providers to use, and they can submit their information using the HHS Accelerator Program, which is a familiar, streamlined system aimed at making it easy for providers who contract with multiple city agencies. As you can see, the implementation process I am about to describe in greater detail is a result of tremendous interagency coordination and collaboration with relevant stakeholders and providers, and every effort has been made to streamline and simplify what would otherwise have been an enormous and complex undertaking for all involved. I will now describe the process used to implement, it, implement the wage adjustment. Each eligible worker will receive the greater of 1150 per hour and a 2.5% wage increase. This wage adjustment may be given any time within 2016, fiscal year 2016, and will be retroactive to and can be retroactive to July 1. As I have said, as part of the wage adjustment, service providers must meet certain requirements. The funds must be used solely to provide wage increases to employees and, provi and providers will need to submit payroll and benefit information prior to initiating contract amendments and then annually. Every effort will be made to make compliance with this requirement as simple and fast, while still ensuring that new funds all go towards the wage increases these workers deserve. The administration decided to use the HHS accelerator as a vehicle for vendors to communicate with their respective agencies about the wage adjustment. As you know, the accelerator is a, is a centralized online portal that aids the procurement process for direct client service providers and they are all familiar with it. On October 1st, eligible providers received an email from the Accelerator team. This email included a cover letter, a draft of the standard, standardized contract amendment, and the simple easy-to-use Excel template for submitting payroll information, 
with instructions on how to report information and share it with the appropriate ag city agencies using the accelerator. The specific instructions ask providers to fill out information on the template. The information includes listing all active and vacant budget positions, current salary or hourly wage, the proportion funded under the contract being amended, and any state or federal cost of living adjustments provided over the last two years. In order to give providers fast and accurate answers to any question they might have, the administration has requested that they contact the HHS Accelerator team via a centralized email address. The Accelerator team will then answer the questions or route them to the appropriate city agency staff as necessary. In order to implement the adjustment and get the additional wages into the hands of deserving employees as quickly as possible, providers were asked to return the, con the completed templates as soon as they can. Once a provider submits its template, the appropriate city agency will review it and contact the provider with any questions or corrections before entering into a contract amendment and registering it with the controller. Every effort is being made to streamline this process, including expedited review by the oversight agencies and follow-up outreach to providers occurred last week, both through the HHS Accelerator and through our partners such as the Human Services Council. In closing, again, I thank you for the opportunity to share the details of the service provider wage adjustment, and I now look forward to answering any questions that you may have on, on the contents of my testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Anantram. Um, Ms. Ringelham, do you want to provide testimony at this time? I don't have testimony. I just... You're fine with that. Uh -huh. No testimony, just here to answer questions that you may have. Great. And is anyone from the HHS Accelerator team here to answer questions? No, but we can definitely carry forward any questions that we can't answer ourselves. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Chair Arroyo. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, it raises quite a number of questions, and I know that we have a number of colleagues who have questions. so. Um, my, the co-chairs will kind of bounce back and forth uh, in between our colleagues. Um, so $54 million uh, was allocated in fiscal year 16 for addressing the cost of living. What are we calling it? It's, uh, a, cost wage of living? it's a wage adjustment for human service workers. And how far along in the process are we in, uh, so in ensuring that uh, providers have a signed executed contract and that the $54 million is indeed being used for the cost of living increase? Um, excellent question. So the 1st of October was when we sent out a standardized communication from the HHS Accelerator to all of the human survey agencies that have contracts with the city. We solicited these, this information from all the city agencies and approximately uh, 4,000 contractors uh, received communication from the Accelerator, which included a cover letter explaining the wage increase, um, a simple template in, uh, in an Excel format that can be uploaded to the Accelerator that includes the wage information, and also a two-page um, contract amendment document that we spent an extensive amount of time um, developing so that each individual agency did not have to do the same thing over and over again, which used to be the practice in the past. Um, we have to date, um, this has been a month now, received about 30% responses back. And um, the due date is when? Well, we, we originally, we said, uh, submitted as fast as possible, and our original estimate was, I think, the 13th of October. Um, clearly, um, some of our contractors have had issues and challenges uh, filling out the documentation. We had hoped that it was going to be as simple as possible because we had made it standard um, across all the city agencies, across all the contracts, because individual providers have contracts with multiple agencies. And one of the goals that we had was to ensure that the contractor did not have to provide information in a different format to every single agency. And that was the reason we undertook this process of um, coming up with a template that would have been standard for all city agencies. Um, so 
it, it's it, clearly we haven't gotten all the responses back by the 13th, um, but we've got a decent number of them, um, and we are, um, and as I said, it's about 30% have responded today. So and if you expected to have them back by October 13th, and you have 30%, I wouldn't define that as decent. Um, well, decent is like 85%. That's, I, it's, I mean, if you're grading it as if I was taking calculus and I, I got 30%, I'm going to fail the class. Uh, that's probably true. No, no, that is true. Yes. <laughs> that is true. So we have 30% to date. Um, that much I can tell you. And we are. Uh, we are continuing to work uh, with all the uh, Human Service Council and who, all the providers who have raised questions on this. We were chatting before this hearing started, and my co-chair threatened you that she was going to ride you very hard. She was going to yes, beat you did. up. Yes, she did. Um, I think I'm going to do that. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I, it just, it just, um, I, this is a serious conversation, yes. and you state in your in your testimony that given the complex nature of the implementation, providers I, they either do it or they don't. I mean, I, I'm I'm very simple. I think mm -hmm. in a very simple way, they 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 have a mandate. This money is ex, is, is intended to be used for ensuring that a contract. So. Who are eligible employees? Because you, you, you have a lot of language in here that's very, very vague, and, and that concerns me. So don't providers have a very clear mandate mm -hmm. from the city that they are required to do X by a particular time, and then how are you going to monitor that moving forward? So. Uh Yes, they have a clear mandate to... Assuming, uh, like, you are the end all to this conversation. So, the, it, it is, it's important that providers fill out this information so that we can actually get the contract amendment process in place. Um, we are doing outreach efforts through our city agencies to find out why these agencies have not responded. And we will follow up with each the one of The agencies or the organizations? The, the agencies, the city agencies will follow up with the organizations. Okay. And we will follow up with each one of them to, to ensure that they're filling out the appropriate And what's your deadline for that? Uh, we are starting this week, and we expect by the end of this week or early next week, we're going to contact all of them. And to what end? To require them to fill out the information that is necessary in the template. What's the consequence if they don't? And I know that some of them are here in the room. Now, I want you coming up here whining about how hard this is. Okay, so let's be clear. Mm -hmm. uh, we, at this point in time, we can only strongly encourage them to supply the information that is required. That's not good the, enough. The contract process that we currently have in place and the contracts that we have in place cannot force them to provide that information. We can request that they provide that information, and we are requesting it as part of the amendment process. Hmm. I, I, um, from right. our, let's from, let's from, not get stuck there. Okay. I disagree with you. I think that if they have a contract with the city, they have an obligation to meet certain requests for information the city may have. Uh, that I commend you for trying to streamline it and making it as user friendly as possible. But at the end of the day, they have a contract with you and they have an obligation and to provide the requested information. And it is our expectation that they will all do so because they have all been asking okay. for wage increases for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, they come to us every year asking so, us so it is to push you guys to do it. And, and it is incumbent that they, they provide this information as quickly as possible because the expectation was that the intention and the expectation clearly is to ensure that all the workers get their wage increases as quickly as possible. Okay, so, and, and I agree with you, and, and I think on that end we, we, we are on the same page. Um, I'm concerned about what appears to be something that puts you in a place where you have no control over their response, responding to you. I, 
let's just leave that there. Okay. okay. Define an eligible worker. Um, all contracts that are held by city agencies that are providing human services work. Um, in all of the agencies that I identified in my testimony are covered. Um, certain programs that recently were instituted like the UPK program or non-human service contracts or programs that are covered under grants that have their own limitations and own requirements were not included. But other than that, it, almost everything has been included. And in fact, agencies that in previous iterations were not covered, like the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice Coordination, the Small Business Services, the Employment Programs, all in the past had never been included. And this time around, we've been, we undertook um, a very collaborative effort, meeting with providers. If, as you recall, the budget was passed in, in, in June. The mayor proposed it in, in May, and, and we only just sent out the letter. So we've been working quite some time trying to make sure that all agencies and all contractors, as much as could possibly be covered under this process, were covered. So it is the most expansive to date that I know. So I, I guess for uh, the members of this, these two committees, what will be helpful, and maybe we do a different forum, maybe not a public hearing, but what are all those nuances? And I think understanding them and, mm -hmm. and being very clear and transparent about those nuances is import, important for us. So we don't beat you up unfairly. Right. Anyone That's that gets true. beat up on here sh just should deserve it, mm -hmm. and Thanks. it can't be out of a lack of information and or a misunderstanding that we may have about what is at play here. It's important, and I will um, encourage my co-chair for our staff to follow up with you and the other um, players at the table here to see if we can. Um, understand better the nuances of what contracts are mm -hmm. uh, expected to follow this um, living wage increase uh, or the 11.50 an hour, and which ones are exempt, and and the logic behind why they're exempt. As far as I'm concerned, city contracts should all require the same kind of bottom line salaries for what employees are paid. On on those contracts, regardless of whether they're driving, I don't know, a bus or whether they are um, doing HIV counseling in some clinic. It really would not matter what they're doing. Uh, they all have a right to earn a wage that allows them to take care of themselves and their families. And I can't stress enough how strongly we all feel that city dollars should not contribute to poverty in our city. Okay. Thank you, Chair Arroyo. I just want to acknowledge the presence of Councilmember Johnson. Welcome. Um, and also in my list of gratitude, Casey Addison is here, policy staff for uh, the Contracts Committee. Um, Mr. Anantram, I just, one quick questions. question. Is part of the challenge trying to um, separate out uh, for a certain title of worker um, how much is paid by the federal government or state government and how much they pay per hour? Is this part of what the contract agency is juggling um, in figuring out the answer? Um. Not exactly. It used to be the case that we used to, um, in previous um, wage increases that had been given out to the human services sector, that we used to have the agencies isolate the portion that was purely tax levy funded. Mm. Um, there are a variety of funding streams that attach themselves to our human service contracts. Some are um, matching funds that grows up regardless of whether um, the state has approved it or not. In other instances, you're required to get the state's approval prior to giving out the cost of living increases. Those are um, adjustments that have to 
to be addressed, but mostly they will be addressed by the agency and the budget office. So from the contractor perspective. Although, wait, time out. On that, in that situation, are you saying that uh, if we have an agency a contract that's jointly funded by city and state funds, probably federal as well, to the extent that the city puts in a dollar, the state would re be required to put in a dollar in the federal government too? Yeah. Um, or depending as long on as the they are, as long as they are open-ended funding streams, yeah, and that the statute does not prohibit um, increases, yes, that. Would so be you true. have to for each contract, each of the four thousand. Wait a minute, for each of the four thousand contracts, then you have to figure out, or the agencies have to figure yeah. out those well, it issues. Wouldn't, it wouldn't be for each of the four thousand. It would be in much bigger categories because it's by program area. So you could have two hundred contracts in a particular program yeah. area that behave in a certain fashion, yeah. and other two hundred that are rather simple. So when you put the money in the budget, the additional I forget what the dollar amount is fifty four million. Yeah. Did you put in? Uh, was a portion of that state and federal funds, uh, or was that all city was, tax levy? Uh, in addition to the 54, that yeah. was around 15 million dollars that were state or federal funds. 50? 1515. So it would be like 659 plus yeah, yeah, yeah. 69. Okay, dollars. great. Yeah. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. uh, Council Member King and then Council Member Wills. Good afternoon, and Good afternoon. thank you for your testimony, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you again for leading this day's conversation. I'm going to fall in line a little bit with um, my chair and my, uh, and my colleague from the Bronx knowing that the Bronx, according to the United Way's report, has the highest inadequacy as far as its salaries and people trying to live. I know we get complaints constantly, you know, trying to be homeful with your children, but you got to work two shifts and three shifts just to be able to sustain. Not to mention how many city workers that we haven't even had the conversation in regards to or finding themselves living in shelters because they're not able to provide for themselves or their families. So something is wrong. Um, so when we start talking about the contract process and people not being able, you it's kind of like you're humbly asking them, please, 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 we need this information. They're saying, uh, the process is a little difficult, uh, we'll get back to you when we can. The problem that I'm having is that if we put $54 million, but if you're getting money from the city, you have a responsibility to comply. You don't have a choice to, you, you have a responsibility to comply. So I'm going to have to ask you all, what do you do? What, what consequences are there? And because I know in some cases and some other agencies, if they don't get their paperwork together for MOX or EMB, if they don't have it together, they don't get their money. So what are y'all prepared to do for everybody else who's, who can't figure it out? Because at the end of the day, those families are still struggling while we're trying to figure out process. So help me understand that. And what, what can you do to help us other than us trying to do this? What can you do? So, so uh, right from the onset, uh, what was expected here is, is um, that the agencies would be swift in responding. So rather than, uh, right from the beginning, we, we believe that, uh, it's on, okay. Um, right from the beginning, um, there was the expectation that the contract agencies would respond swiftly. We don't quite know all the reasons why they haven't, which is why we are reaching out to them individually to find out what their issues are. I'm sorry, you say contract agencies, are not responding. Uh, our city agencies? No, the contractors. Okay, so why don't we say organizations? Sorry. Yes, agencies are an animal of government. That's There's true. a difference. Okay, that is true. so we're talking so about the providers. The provider okay. organizations. Thank you. So it could very well be that they're encountering difficulties that we don't know about. And that is the reason why we have asked the city agencies to reach out to these organizations to find out how we can be helpful in the process. So I, I do not want at this point in time to point the blame at the organization without completely understanding what their issues are. I am certain that all of them want to do us. Is there a time frame for a response? And if they don't respond in a time frame, what do we do? Because then again, we still have people who can't manage their lives because we in downtown haven't figured out, or someone, someplace, us organization hasn't figured out how to communicate that they're having challenges. What are the consequences? There has to be some consequences, otherwise, we'll be back going to fiscal 17 and still having this conversation. So, for, for the three months and four months that we've worked on this issue with the Human Services Council and major providers in the arena, I have not heard for one instance where they have not they've said, no, we don't want this money. 
uh, almost universally everybody has asked that we do this fast, as quickly as possible, as simply as possible, and that's what we've tried to do. Um, again, before we go into a penalty phase of identifying how what could be done, I think it's important for us to understand what limitations the organizations have. Um, I, I guess I'm less skeptical than you all are in this process. Well, you keep saying the challenges that these organizations have, and so then I have to move to my, what kind of communication is happening to find out what challenges that they're having, because you got to know this, you know, it, it can't keep going on. Someone has to communicate I'm having a problem, because what I'm hearing from people haven't responded. There has to be a reason why somebody has responded, and what do we do when people haven't responded? Um, so our outreach this week um, will tell us a lot more about that. And we can definitely communicate back to you what we have heard back in responses and what kind of time frame we can expect. We're glad to follow up. Okay, I look forward to that. And hopefully you set your own time frame, not just leaving it out there and hopefully that someone respond, control the process a little more. I, I would like to see that happen. It, it, is, doable. it is absolutely so, imperative for us to get this done as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you, Madam Chairs. Yeah, thank you, Councilman King. Um, you know, uh, we'll hear, I think, from the Human Services Council about specific problems that the providers are having. Um, and I appreciate that OMB is sort of one layer removed mm -hmm. because you're not talking directly to the provider, you're talking to the agencies. Um, I also think there's an interesting dynamic of the HHS accelerator folks being much close, closer to the provider than MOX in this situation. I mean, because as we learn about what problems the agencies are having in filling out the forms, would that what can we learn? Mm -hmm. Sorry, the providers, thank you, in filling out the forms. What are we learning about that from a contracting point of view? And in a way, maybe it's not MOX who's at the end of the day responsible, but the HHS accelerator folks. Is that a fair thing to say? So, I think it's a, it's a two-part question. Oh, and can so, you introduce yourself oh, one more time? Laura Lawrence. Ringelheim, Deputy General Counsel at MOX. Um, there, there's a portion that is submitted, I believe, through HHS, HHS Accelerator that's going to have the two-page contract amendment, but then the agency will submit the RCAM through the, the regular process. So it's not, I'm not sure that HHS Accelerator can give you additional information in terms of what the contracting process is or the problems that they might be having. They, if there, if there are problems, the organizations can still reach out to the agency to help them through that. I, I, and I, I don't know because I'm not sure of the process that they would go through Accelerator, but I believe they're going to go through the agency with right, any right. problems that they have. And so should we be talking to the ACOs of a particular agency, like the HRA? Um, uh, what's, what does ACO stand for again? It's the Agency the, Chief Contracting Officer. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can you answer So, that? yes. I mean, uh, the, um, the Accelerator has been the vault that we've used to try and coordinate questions from different agencies, different organizations, sorry, thank you. Uh, the, it hasn't gotten to the agency level yet. Wherever right. we have, what we've tried to do is field questions through a single um, point so that we can be consistent in our responses okay, to all the agencies. So we have worked very collaboratively, we, the Office of Management and Budget, has worked very collaboratively with the accelerator to try and answer the questions that have come through the accelerator. The accelerator in itself, or the team in the accelerator itself, uh, does not necessarily answer questions other than standard responses that we've sort of laid out for things that might be, which contract do I respond to? My contract is not showing up in the accelerator or in the email that you sent me. Yeah. Why is it not there? Those kinds of questions or what we fielded to date. Wherever there are substantive, programmatic, agency-related questions, we've reached out to the agency to try and get a response and funnel it back through the accelerator to the contract, to the organization, uh, because it's important 
in our perspective, to have a single point of review as opposed to the no, absolutely, and it'll become incredibly important in, yes. in years going forward. In many ways, you're taking the time now to set the stage so that the process in the future will okay. run much more smoothly. Do you think that for this window of time, maybe only in the first year, that I don't know who it would be, maybe uh, in the contracting officer's uh, office in the agencies or at HHS Accelerate or at MOX, do you think that there might be a need for additional staff in order to process this um, because it's so new for the providers and they are, will, as we'll hear later, working through so many different component parts? Um, again, I, I think that the outreach that we do next week I'm sorry. Come on, PB, it's your parting <laughs> no, shot. No, the outreach that we do next week will inform us a whole lot about okay. how, what we need to do. I, I don't want to minimize um, <laughs> staffing resources if necessary, and I, I think all of us have embarked on this journey to make sure that yeah. workers get all the money as soon as possible, so there is no hesitation on our part to add resources if necessary. Oh, it's great. I'm going to... <laughs> no question. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. We turned over uh, to the co-chair. Uh, so fiscal year 16 started July 1st. Today is November 2nd. What? Why are we having this conversation today and why are we doing outreach this week? And we'll know by next week maybe what the problems are. Uh, it is true. Uh, we, are, we are four months into the process already. Uh, but it, we did use the four months to try and minimize any um, difficulties in the process going forward. So we have invested time at the front end of the process so that things can be a lot more systematic and straightforward and that we gather information that can be useful for us in future iterations and also to plan better for this workforce. Is this a brand new process? Absolutely it is. Okay. Um, and at some point, somebody is going to explain to me what this HHS accelerator is, uh, because there's, there's uh, an assumption that we all understand what it is and what it does and whether or not it's appropriate and the technology works and all of that other stuff. So uh, along with the nuance conversation that we hope to have uh, so that we can have a better understanding uh, of why certain services or contracts are not included in this cost of living increase uh, that that we as council members understand some of the mechanisms that mm -hmm. enable contracts to get successfully executed and people to get paid yeah. so I, I mean I'm not wanted to demand penalties on a provider God knows we don't pay them enough to do the work they do and and slowing money to getting to the providers is just not going to make any of what we're discussing any better. Uh, but certainly there has to be. Um, so what is it and what does it do? Not for so, right now, not for right now, but at some point when we absolutely. have follow-up conversation, can get you a, We can get you okay. a document outlining okay. what the Thank happened you. Service. Council Member Wills. Good afternoon. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions um, for clarity. The this additional funding is only for the wages for the employees? That is correct. Wages and wage-related fringes. Okay, so then are we considering fringes only the health benefits? Health? No, the fringes would be payroll-related. So like, then uh, they could use the money towards their portion of the Social Security and Medicare, things like that? Um, the Social Security increases that are pay considered payroll taxes would be covered, yes. And they would be covered by the additional money? Within the 54 or the $69 million, it will cover all of those increases. So it will, it will include the increase of the 2.5% for mm -hmm. the individual plus the associated fringe costs. That okay, so that's, okay yes. I just wanted to be clear yes. on that. Um, and how does this impact the long-term costs, like pension costs? So if there are pension costs associated with the wage increase, we mm -hmm. would cover that too. Okay. Um, uh, 
Mrs. Miller from um, in her statement, well, in her record, that's the thing that she input for the record, her testimony. She said the raising the wage floor and enacting an appropriate COLA that is automatically indexed to inflation will keep non-for-profit wages competitive and ensure the recruitment of retention of skilled workers. Do you agree with that? Uh, I can read it again if you want me to go again, just so you it, can absorb it's, it. It's, it's too open a question, I think. I haven't undertaken enough studies to sort of ascertain that. Clearly, okay, anybody, so clearly, what we, an appropriate wage, and I'm sorry, PV, I, I'm a fan of your work, so I know when I'm asking you a question, you'll, uh, an appropriate wage is what most or oftentimes helps us to sustain a, a workforce that is diligent and able to carry out the job functions, right? Yes. That if you is pay correct. peanuts, you get monkeys. That is correct. So if this is true in the non for profit sector, if they're not competitive at this point, and us giving this money and going up to eleven dollars and fifty cents, how when do we begin to bridge that gap to make sure that they become competitive? Is it a year, two years, three years after this implementation? Are we raising it up? So um one of the reasons why we undertook a survey prior to actually doing this wage increase mm -hmm. was to understand what workers in the sector made. We got back responses that were all over the place, but clearly indicated a lot of people were working, you know, two jobs or part-time works and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the basis that allowed us to decide what the increase ought to be. Um, and the mayor had already promulgated the living wage for of, of eleven fifty, and that pegged the number to eleven fifty. The we have also the administration has also been very much on the record in um, in suggesting that the minimum wage ought to be fifteen dollars, and and we're glad that the governor has stepped up in the same manner, and the legislature has also equally agreed. So it is our expectation that as we move forward, that that will become law, and it won't be for debate. So if we're, we, so you're saying that we're waiting until the $15 becomes law before we acknowledge that people need to make $15 and pay them that? What, because if that's the case, I think that we should what, have a tear that goes up to 15 in two years regardless. What, what we have um, done in this process is address um, wage increases that the sector has not received for a long time. Um, what we have done in, in recognition of that is pegged the floor at 1150, which was mm -hmm. the living wage for the city, and a two and a half percent increase. Um, that's what this particular initiative has done. Um, as regards to future increases, I'm sure that as we go through this process and do budget after budget, we will come to some recognition of what the needs are in this sector and address it accordingly. The, um, will the future RFPs take this into account? The uh, the needed or the yeah the needed additional um, funding for salaries. So the next RFPs that come out for these providers, will we already say that hey we know that they need to be paid fifteen dollars an hour. So let's um, let's make sure that we uh, compensate them at those levels. So when we get the request back in, we already know that they need to come at that point. So that way it stops us from having to go through four or five budget cycles to get to that point. Is that something that you guys have looked at? Um, we haven't looked at it that specifically, but I do know that there are some legal limitations on what we can and cannot ask in mm -hmm. our contracts, and I, I guess corporate counsel is much better at responding to that. I don't, I don't understand that. How could, I understand our limitations legally, but if we're paying and we're saying that the workers should make this amount or the services are due this amount in pay, then how would that present a legal um, hurdle? If, we're the, if the city is paying the money, then it should not present a legal order if we're providing the finances um, for the contracts. If we're recognizing that in an RFP, that shouldn't appear to present a legal order. I, I defer to um, the law department on that. I don't know that I can specify wages in my contracts. I'm not certain mm -hmm. about it, but I'll defer to the law department. I okay. can get your response if you like. And co um, co-chairs, my last question would be um, the specific employees that are covered under this? Are there any employees that are not eligible for this initiative? Um, there are DOE employees, uh, for instance, that are food handlers that come in contact with our children every single day. Um, are they, if they're not contracted by a client provider or providing, if they're just working directly for the agency, are they covered? What happens with their wages? Um, I 
I can get you clarification on that. I don't know the specific instance, but okay. I can definitely get, get you clarification on that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Coach. Yes. Uh, Councilmember Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chairs Arroyo and uh, Rosenthal, for having this hearing. PV, thank you for your testimony and for answering uh, the questions today. Um, I, I know that uh, the mayor has talked uh, very frequently, of course, about income inequality in our city and also nationally and doing all we can here in the city uh, and partnering with the council when possible, when our goals aligned on trying to help folks who are not making enough to make ends meet in New York City. One of the ways we've done that is through universal pre-K, mm -hmm. lifting the burden off of people. Instead of having to pay for childcare, uh, they can then use that money for other purposes to support themselves and their families. Um, the mayor supports raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. That's correct. That's right. Yes. So why aren't we putting in money to raise this up to $15 an hour? I go back to my previous response. This particular wage increase was to address the fact that, that our contractors had not received wage increases for a long time. And at the time that we proposed this, the floor that the mayor had laid out for the living wage was 1150. It made sense for us. The previous mayor. This mayor. This mayor. This oh, mayor at that time. Mayor, right. In um, September of 2014. Before the wage course. board was called for fast food workers to get that the $15 correct. increase. That is, that is correct. But now the mayor supports fast food workers mayor, getting a $15 the mayor increase. The has always supported a $15 wage increase. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to sort of support that. And, and the governor has stepped up to that, as has the legislature. So it is an expectation that it would become law. Um, you have to also understand that is a, a phased-in approach to $15. We are, at this point in time, um, about that schedule that the governor has set out. Uh, we, we expect that that minimum wage will come to pass. Do you, um, I'm, I know, given uh, your, uh, you know, history and, and your position at, at OMB, of course, you are, uh, uh, you know about the self-sufficiency standard uh, that, that's talked about. The United Way uh, submitted testimony today related to the self-sufficiency standard here in New York City, and it shows that uh, a single adult living in the Bronx constituting the least expensive neighborhood across the city's five boroughs must earn at least $12.76 uh, hourly which in turn ends up being $26,951 annually just to afford basic minimum expenses. It starts to go up when you get to more expensive neighborhoods. In Queens, it would need to be $15.36 an hour. Uh, in the Bronx, if it was a parent uh, that had a child, the floor wage would have to be $24.99 an hour. And uh, when uh, they're not making those wages, what happens frequently is people then rely upon uh, government programs to be able to get the support needed to actually support themselves and their family. And we, of course, want people to be self-sufficient and to make good wages and to put that money back into the economy and to have a good life. Um, so what is the ultimate plan to get it higher than what we're talking about today? Besides the legislature, I mean, we can never rely upon the legislature doing the right thing, ever. I mean, us relying upon a Republican state Senate raising wages for workers here in New York City. I mean, I'm glad the governor called the wage board, but what do we do? I don't feel comfortable. I think the assembly will do the right thing, but I don't feel comfortable waiting until next June to see if this is gonna happen. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I What's the plan? That. What's the plan to get it up higher than $11.50 eventually if the mayor has a core belief that the minimum wage should be $15 an hour? And I think the mayor's core belief is true of all workers in the city yes. of New York. Yes, yes. This, this particular wage increase was intended for human service workers in contract with the city of New York. But we and still don't think clear. it's enough, right? And we clearly want the minimum wage to be $15. There so is no question about that. And we are expecting that the legislature will act appropriately and, and move it forward. <coughs> At this point in time, what we have on the table so, is 1150 wage how, increase. Council Member Johnson, if, if I may add to, to the question. So the state says, yay, $15 an hour. 
and we're all happy and we celebrate that and it gets us a little further along in the conversation how do we fund it or are the providers contracts going to remain stagnant and then we're having a conversation about maybe cutting services as opposed to increasing salaries uh, if if the law were to pass and uh, the minimum became whatever the minimum becomes uh, we would normally evaluate what the need would be uh, and discuss it with the council in passing a budget that would allow for that increased wages to be passed through to the extent um, we have an agreement on that regard. There isn't a clean, automatic, contractual process that increases it. It has to be uh, pursuant to a budget action but that both the executive Well, I understand that. Where does the money come from? Do we go print it at City Hall? Or the, it, do we presume that it's going to come with, or is this going to be another one of those unfunded mandates that we often talk about? Um, it feels good. It's a nice press release, a nice press conference. At the end of the day, the revenue of the city is what it is. How do we accommodate? Well, we, we definitely hope that any increases uh, that um, come as a result of state legislation will bring funding along with it. Um, but okay. with the same token, we also recognize. I'm sorry, Councilman. I, I just have one final question. Um, so, you know, we're talking about record numbers of people in the shelter system in New York City. I really applaud the administration for all the money they've put forward over the last two budget cycles in trying to set up a rental assistance program and get support to individuals who need it to get them out of shelter and into permanent housing. And we've seen actually tens of thousands of people get moved into permanent housing because of the programs, but the number is still at a record high. And I know you're not with DHS, uh, but I think a good question to ask here is, we know that a certain number, uh, I think it's over 30% of that 57,000 uh, number of folks that are in shelter right now, I think it's 30% are people with full-time jobs working 40 hours a week, which is shameful. I mean, it's awful that someone's working 40 hours a week, playing by the rules, trying to support themselves and their family, and they still can't afford a roof over their heads. I wonder, out of that, whatever that number is of individuals who are working full time and are in the shelter system, how many of them are these type of workers? How many of them are doing this type of work, supporting other people in New York City through social services, and then ending up in the shelter system themselves because of where the wage is. I just think it's a question that we should ask and see if DHS has any statistics and number on that. We saw there was a report, not that I go by what the New York Post says, but we saw a report in the Post a couple of months ago that said that there were certain Parks Department employees who were sleeping in their own cars and were in the shelter system because they weren't being paid enough money. The point here is, and, and, and I'm not attacking you because I think the administration has been moving in the right direction, as I said, on, on UPK and on putting uh, money towards social services and on this. But the ultimate issue is we are hamstrung by the federal government and by Albany because they set the minimum wage. And what we can do as a city to raise wages for workers that need it most workers that are really contributing to the city, workers who are primarily women and people of color. We should use every tool in our budget arsenal to do that. Thank you for your question today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Johnson, for nailing it, as always. Um, uh, hang on one second. That was sweet. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Mr. Anantram, could you please introduce the people from OMB who are with you in their titles? Sure. Alice, to my right is Alison Brick. She's the Assistant Director for Social Services. Um, and uh, to my left is Simonia Brown, um, who is the Associate Director for Education, Intergovernmental, and Community Boards. Okay. And between the two of them, how many of the 11 agencies does that cover? Uh, probably nine out of the eleven, or eight or nine out of the eleven. Okay. Um, 
except for health. So Alison Brick oversees all the social service agencies, which yeah. is the vast majority of these programs. Um, Ms. Brown's portfolio includes education, and they have education-related programs that are covered here, too. What is not, the people who are not here yeah. are the health services agency and the criminal justice agencies. Why is criminal justice being covered under this? Is, it's uh, there it's are the human, human service, service aspects of criminal justice, the alternatives to detention, alternative uh. displacement, legal services for things of that nature, except for the 18B attorneys. And SPS? SPS is covered too, and they're not here either, sorry. No, 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 what are the human service contracts? Um, the employment programs under SPS are covered. Would it be possible for you to provide to the council by agency, you say it's uh, 800 providers, 4,000 contracts, what's the easiest way, I don't know how to pitch the question, mm -hmm. but if we wanted to get a sense by agency of either the category of contracts or, I, I don't want to make the work harder, but something you we already can, have at can, your desk. We can get you a list of programs, broad programs under agencies. That For each agency. Flavor that would be great. Um, and then ultimately is where you're trying to go that, and, and I don't know that the council as an oversight agency needs to see, uh, oversight body needs to necessarily see this, but you would have by title, sort of the wage mm -hmm. um, from where and where you're going, but the titles for each contract could be getting currently a different different wages, hypothetically, That's right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, so for each title for each contract, uh, the wage then and then up to the 1150 or higher, depending on the 2.5, and then. You said there's a piece that is a Social Security add-on, a pension add-on. What are the other add-on pieces? Any payroll, like um, you know, unemployment insurance benefits would be covered. Um, so you would have that, and then and then that would be a total for each title for each contract, and then it would hypothetically add up to fifty-four million dollars. It is, yes, hypothetically, yes. Okay, it we're is, or for rather $69 million because right, right, it's right. $15 million. It, it is our expectation that we can aggregate that kind of information from the, from the template that we put out to, right. the, uh, to the organizations so that we can then look at it, analyze it, understand the labor force better and try and figure out which program areas pay better, which service areas pay better, which trades pay better. So a whole lot oh, of questions so hypothetically, that you can ask. Uh, you're going to be hypothetically equalizing the contracts. Not necessarily equalizing it, but it allows us to understand the differences yeah. and rationalize why so or not, and then make policy decisions based on that. Do you have a rough idea just off the top of your head, and I know this is a hearing, but I won't hold you to it, because this is why we have drafts, and we're going to call it a draft, um, what you think it would cost to get us to $15 an hour for the human service contract workers. And I know it means opening uh, Pandora's box because then we have crossing guards that we have to get from 11.15 to 11.50 to 15 dollars an hour. But if we were only talking about human service contract workers, and it's it's a very difficult question to answer only because the results that we got back from the survey um, identified people making four dollars an hour. Um, and, so something's so wrong with the question. It's no. Or is somebody well, really a making four dollars? It was very now. impromptu. It wasn't necessarily a rigorous survey document. It was um, just to get a sense as to what it might be, and as a basis okay. for making an estimate in a budget. So, I, I would be loath to put something out there that is four dollars an hour on a city contract. I'm sorry. Well, this is the thing. It was incorrect in its responses. We clearly knew that was not the case, okay. right. and and which is the reason why I'm loath to share information okay. that is on. Hypothetically, once we have the information that gets us to the route of the fifty of the sixty-nine million dollars, right. you could then make an estimate. Absolutely. So, do you think that? Uh, is the goal to get this really ready to go by the January, the February preliminary budget? 
So uh, that you could mod over the money around then? Yes, the expectation clearly is that we would have all the responses right. by then and so, be able to identify the amount per agency. And then, so who would we ask the question to as a council? Would we ask the OMB director at the beginning of the budget season what the number would be and, and he would know? Well, we, we've already budgeted for the amount. It's no, no, up to 15. Oh. Um, I think you have to wait for the responses to come back and conduct a, an analysis of it to see wh what the numbers would look like. Whether it can be done before the preliminary plan, it depends on how many people respond, how fast they respond. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you, yes. Chair Arroyo. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, mm, eligible employees uh, is a something I have an issue with and also providers can make the wage increase retroactive to July 1st why wouldn't they they will and is that are you leaving that up to them um, yes uh, why? We don't, what we can do at this point in time is provide the funding necessary to go back to July 1 it is why wouldn't they want more money I, I don't dispute that. I agree that they should want more money and they should do it and they uh -huh. hopefully would do it. But there's no mandate that there is, they... There is, it is, yes, there is no mandate on it. Despite the fact that you're giving them the money? I'm, despite the fact that the $54 million accommodates yes. for that? That is correct. Well, our expectation is that almost everybody would okay, go so back to we'll July 1. So I hear from the providers about whether yeah. or not they intend to do that. Uh, and, and I'm still not, uh, I'm having a hard time understanding what's an eligible employee. Uh, and maybe um, I'm not the smartest person in the room, but well, I just questions. don't understand why every single employee on a contract with the city is not covered under this living wage or in, in, in general, cost of living increase. In general, they're all covered. Um, there are all titles in the contract are covered. Um, I, I, there's probably very few. Uh, the eligible worker category is a term of legal significance, I guess. Um, there are some program areas that are not covered. There are, there are con pro organizations that receive funding from both the city and the state and the federal government. So the contractor, so the funding that follows the state contract is not covered by this. So I understand. The, I understand that. I just, yeah. and you know, for the basis of this conversation, this is about city contracts, and that every employee on the city contract is making at least yes eleven fifty an hour. Yes, that is the expectation, regardless of the service. That's you did say there's some services that are exempt, like universal pre-K. Why? Universal Pre-K was is, is a new contract. It was um, the, um, the 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 terms of the wages that were negotiated between the organization and the um, Department of Education took into account all the exemplary standards that were necessary to provide for a qualitative UPK program. So it's our expectation that those wages are already covered. Covered in what? What do you mean in, covered? In that the right amount of wages are already being that they're making at least that. Yes. Okay. So, so I am really looking forward to a follow-up conversation, um, so that I can better understand the the nuance, mm -hmm. uh, so that I can be a little smarter about um, this overall conversation. I don't see why there should be a difference and if what you're explaining if I understand what you're explaining that there really isn't a difference then we shouldn't be talking about eligible workers like every worker on a contract should be making at a minimum 1150 an hour whether they work two hours or 20 or 40 um, and and then we're going to talk about the the nuance about how sometimes these are part-time workers and they have to get more than one job because they are not full-time employees uh, and and having run a program myself for many years I understand the nuances uh, about that mm -hmm. but hopefully we're employing people full-time and paying them well over 1150 an hour 
that that just has to be the bottom line. We shouldn't even be having this conversation mm -hmm. at all. You didn't make it up, so I'm not going to be here. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Chair Arroyo. I want to oh, I have, I'm sorry, Go ahead. one more. One more. And, and we've been joined by Councilmember Gibson from the Bronx. Thank you for joining us. There, the, the city contract process, um, often when you um, read the language on the RFP, eligible responders must be a 501c3. Are you contracting with for-profit entities now? Or is, is there a different requirement for for different services based on the no, the the 501c3 stuff i am not certain that there aren't for profit contractors with us i'm sure that you are, are not people. certain that there are not that is correct uh, i am i'm sure there are some for profit contractors in in the so every rfp sphere. that that is released by the city for profit companies are eligible to compete for that money. That's for my that understanding. Company. I don't know of any. That limitation. is your understanding. Now, the law department can opine better on that, but I, it's my understanding that, that the competition is open, that there is not a limitation. It's no longer limited to non yeah, non profit. Uh, yeah. Um, for the for the, the vast majority of our contractors are nonprofit contractors. No, I nonprofit. understand that, but I I know that one of the greatest criticisms we levied against the Bloomberg administration is that he changed the landscape, and that yeah. our 501c3s in the city that have been providing services for decades are now competing against larger firms that have significantly um, stronger abilities to put stuff on paper, not necessarily provide better service, and which is why we've been so adamant about the, the nonprofit stabilization fund to make sure that the, the, the nonprofits, the, the guys that have been there in the trenches for decades, have a much um, better ability to compete for these contracts because the for-profit companies are coming in and, and basically taking over mm -hmm. the, the work and then when we talk about uh, requirements under a contract for profit entities and nonprofit entities, what's the what's the requirement for each, and is there a different bar for yeah. either one? I, I, I'm sure there's not more than a handful of for profit providers, if there are any. I do remember in the personal care arena, Personal Touch used to be in service, mm -hmm. and that's a for profit company. And I'm sure there are some employment programs mm -hmm. that were for profit, but they're far and few between. We shouldn't be encouraging <coughs> that, not, you know, for-profit companies to come in and, and, and run services that we all know end up not being as quality as the nonprofit provider mm -hmm. um, world provides in our communities. Uh, the bottom line is what they focus on, and they're going to cut corners at every turn, and that is not something that I and I'm sure my co-chair um, would not be in support of, that we should look at reverting back to, in order to compete for city contracts, you must be a 501c3. Thank you, Ms. Um, Mr. Nantram, one quick last question. Sure. Is it the case that the federal government mandates that state, state and city, state and localities uh, allocate a 10% overhead for nonprofit contract contracting providers, um, I know that the federal government has recently promulgated um, new rules on the administrative overheads that relate to grantees and the subgrantees. Um, we are still evaluating what that particular ruling applies to, and uh, which of our subgrant, which of our grantees, if we are. If we are the grantees, which of the sub-grantees um, would be eligible for that increase? So I don't have a clean answer for you, but yes, it is a federal requirement. Great. I think it's going to be a topic of another hearing, um, so it's something I'm very interested in. I just want to end by saying that OMB was lucky to have you for 25 years from my perspective. And it was a pleasure for me to work side by side with you when we did at OMB. And um, boy, um, you've 
left really big shoes to fill, but it looks like you have some incredibly able people who are going to help the next person um, do the job. But whew, I know I'm really going to miss working with you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, I'm going to call up the next panel. Um, Emily Miles from the Federation of Protestant and Welfare Agencies, James Parrott from Fiscal Policy Institute, and Michelle Jackson from the Human Services Council. Did a great job. Yes. Um, so I know you guys work together all the time. Is there someone, have you already decided who goes first? Uh, just kick it off when you're ready. Thank you. Okay. If you could just introduce yourself when you start your testimony. Um, is this on? Yep. My name is James, James, James Parrott. I'm the uh, Deputy Director and Chief Economist of the Fiscal Policy Institute. And Emily and Michelle will introduce themselves before they testify. Um, thank you very much for having this hearing. Um, obviously, this is a very important topic <clears throat> that affects a lot of um, what New York City does and a lot of people who live in New York City. Um, <clears throat> in including funding for a first ever 1150 an hour wage floor and a 2.5% COLA, for other workers um, in the adopted budget, um, this, the mayor and the council took an important first step um, in moving toward uh, reaching uh, pay adequacy for uh, social service workers in New York City. We are particularly pleased to see that in implementing the wage floor, a wide net was cast that extends even to human service contracts managed by the Department of Education. This new approach to uh, human service contracts is in sharp contrast to how thousands of low-paid human service contract workers were treated in city contracts for many years when their pay and fringe benefits were a subject of total indifference at best. Up to this point, the city has never compiled systematic data about the pay and compensation of its human services contract workforce. It's as if the city were buying widgets and the only thing that mattered was to minimize the cost of widgets as much as possible. We estimate that 15,000 to 18,000 full and part-time human service workers will see their average pay increase by 17% retroactive to July 1st, and another 50,000 or so workers in this sector will benefit from a 2.5% COLA, the first since 2008. This workforce is overwhelmingly female and persons of color, and many live in some of the poorest neighborhoods in the city. It has always been clear to the advocates pushing for a meaning, meaningful human services wage floor that we needed to reach a living wage level of $15 in relative short order, and that it needed to be indexed from that point on. We are working toward that end and toward the companion goal of instituting a sector-wide education and training fund so that human service workers will be able to acquire additional education, skills, and credentials in order to move up a career ladder, further enhance their earnings, and help contribute to improve quality of service delivery. We're heartened by and have been integrally involved in the establishment of a $15 wage for fast food workers and the governor's recent proposal for a statewide $15 minimum wage across all sectors of the state economy. The crucial thing that has to happen at this point as the legislature and the governor move forward on the proposal for an across the board $15 minimum wage is to make sure that state human service contracts uh, include funding to allow uh, nonprofits around the state to pay higher wages 
and that the state provides additional assistance to local governments so that county social service contracts and also uh, other uh, local government entities like school districts have the funding they need in order to pay the $15 uh, minimum wage. The self-sufficiency family budgets for New York City are an important tool for understanding how far our economy and its system of rewards are from where we should be. A worker working hard and playing by the rules should be able to support her or himself and family without reliance on public assistance or private charity. Inadequate earnings for New York City workers are a pervasive problem. Let me highlight three uh, bullets from the self-sufficiency analysis. The cost of meeting basic family budget needs in New York City has risen nearly three times as fast as median earnings since 2000. In 2014, 42% of working age households, nearly a million households overall, have earnings that fall short of what's needed to meet basic bare bones family budget needs. More than three out of every four families whose earnings fall short of budget adequ adequacy are Latino, Black, or Asian. These staggering numbers reflect the real cost of our pronounced income polarization. If we had something like a broad sharing of the fruits of economic growth, poverty would be much, much lower, and every family would have the earnings it takes to meet uh, family budget needs. We've had the growth, but not the sharing of the benefits of that growth. We will not get to self-sufficiency overnight, but we should be ever mindful of that goal and act to make sure that private and public practices are put, in, put us on a path towards self-sufficiency. The self-sufficiency report provides specific recommendations in 14 areas that were developed by a number of policy advocate groups working together. The establishment of a funded wage floor for human service contract workers points in the direction of self-sufficiency, as does a $15 statewide minimum wage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Parrott. Can I ask um, for the next two speakers, I'm not going to put you on a clock, but can you sort of bring your high, the highlights of your testimony to the floor? Thank you so much. So my name is Emily Miles. I'm the Director of Policy Advocacy and Research at the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify before you today. I won't repeat um, the data from James's testimony, but I do want to put a quick face on who we're talking about. Um, when we are talking about these frontline workers who are providing these vital services, 52% of whom um, are earning less than $14 an hour, we're talking about um, a majority being women from communities of color providing these vital services. And we've heard stories from our member agencies of these workers standing in the same food pantry lines with the very clients they serve that later that day, applying for the very housing services that their organizations provide, and having to choose between doing their job well um, and being able to afford eyeglasses, going to the doctor for themselves and their families. So these are real um, issues that these workers are facing. And this is largely due to the historic inadequate funding of New York City and state contracts. Uh, in the fall of 2014, FPWA and the Physical Policy Institute launched a career ladder project with the two recommendations for the creation of the wage floor and the Comprehensive Investment in Education and Training Fund, which resulted in the 1150 wage floor. Um, we also want to thank HSC for their advocacy on the 2.5% COLA. Moving forward, um, we have several recommendations for you. First, we look forward to continuing to work with the city to ensure that the wage floor is increased with a goal of reaching $15 um, by at the latest FY18. Um, additionally, we recommend that the council move to codify this wage floor to ensure the longevity of these wages beyond the current mayoral administration. To do that, we recommend amending the city's existing living wage ordinance in several ways. First, including language to establish the city's responsibility to fund the wage floor and also to index the wage floor to ensure the wages of social service employees are adjusted with the rate of inflation. 
Additionally, we urge the mayor and the city council to support the increase in social services wages beyond New York City. At the state level, these wages are just as pervasively low um, and cause the same amount of hardships for these workers. As the state takes steps to increase the minimum wage to $15 for all workers, we must ensure that state contracts are amended immediately to ensure the appropriate funding for those wage increases. And we look forward to working with the council to amplify this issue on a state level to ensure those wage increases. Now I'm on. Great. <laughs> so good afternoon, Chair Arroyo, Chair Rosenthal, and members of the Committees on Community Development Contracts. My name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Associate Director for the Human Services Council. I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify and also for holding this important hearing on wages in the human services field. Uh, HSC is a membership association representing nearly 200 of New York's leading nonprofit organizations, uh, including direct service providers and umbrella and advocacy groups. Again, I will not reiterate a lot of what uh, my colleagues have said about who, the, who we are as a workforce, so I'll give you broad level highlights. Um, uh, in addition to being 85% women, 75% people of color, we're also an economic engine. We employ over 100,000 people in New York City just on city contracts. That's not, you know, we also have state contracts, private uh, funding, and federal funding as well. Um, we haven't seen a raise in city contracts since 2008, uh, with very few exceptions. Um, and the last COLA was in 2008 and was 3%. Uh, similarly, at the state level, we had uh, issues with the COLA. Uh, we haven't had one. Um, there was one that was just put in place in 2012. Um, but we like to refer to that as Diet COLA because it was for a much <laughs> smaller uh, set of workforce uh, in a very convoluted spreadsheet that I can share with you. Um, we're very happy um, that the mayor has made this incredible uh, incredible commitment, not just the 2.5% COLA, but the establishing a wage floor of 1150. I think this is a really important first step. Um, but of course, uh, while understanding the limitations of the budget, this is really just a start. Um, the lack of COLA and investments in programs have a real impact on not just workers, but also programs and communities. There's a very high turnover rate in the nonprofit sector due to the lack of wage increases. And this is not it's obviously um, reduces the efficiencies of agencies, but more importantly, the people that we serve rely on caseworkers. They rely on seeing the same receptionist every day. It's very important um, to the programs and to the people that we serve that they have that kind of interaction and a high turnover rate, uh, for example, in preventive services, it's over 30% um, is really problematic. And these are not low wage jobs. Um, these are people that we rely on to take care of our children, uh, people with substance abuse issues, mental health issues, and the fact that they're getting paid a low wage means that we have a hard time recruiting and maintaining talent that we need in order to provide these services. Uh, while we're very pleased that the city has finally acknowledged the dire need with our, within our workforce, um, this COLA does not account for the losses of the previous six years. So 2.5%, while a great start, uh, doesn't meet the cost of inflation for this year or the last six years um, overall. And uh, we're, our workforce is really looking for these important increases. Um, we're also hoping to work with the administration and the council to systematize the COLA um, so that I don't have to come every five years and do advocacy uh, as much as I enjoy it. Uh, I'd like to do advocacy on something else than asking for 2.5% every five years. Um, this is now my second time around. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to spend my time doing something else. I also want to say that I that HSC and the sector support the minimum wage increase at the state to $15. We're very supportive of these efforts as they get at the core anti-poverty initiatives of our work. We, The work of our sector is to move people out of poverty and into the middle class, and the $15 wage is imperative to that. Human services workers need to be included in that, um, and funding needs to come from the state and the city. We cannot raise prices of our goods and services to make that wage increase. Um, and as council members have pointed out, any wage increase that doesn't come with corresponding dollars means a loss of services. Uh, I also am happy to answer questions about Accelerator, um, and because HSC was integral in creating that. And I know you have a lot of questions about implementation um, of the COLA, and I'd be happy to answer that. But I won't go through the 10-minute uh, speech on it. I'll, okay. I'll answer what you have. And, and We'll save the accelerator conversation for, you know, sidebar, not, not here right now. What are you hearing from providers that can address why information is not coming to OMB or to the agencies in the data that's required in order for us to move this implementation of the LM50? 
So I will say that we're first very happy that it's, they're using an HSS accelerator and they're not going through the specific city agencies to do this so that there's not a bunch of redundant processes. And we realized that that took time to create that spreadsheet, get agency buy-in, and send it out to providers. It took three months for OMB to get the spreadsheet together from implementation date and five months since the COLA was announced. And they gave providers eight days to turn in the spreadsheet. Um, the spreadsheet is as simple as I think it could be, but it's still very complicated. There's hundreds of staff lines that need to be filled in. They need to find out how much of the, that person's work for, you know, that person's salary is on the city contract. Um, providers, I think most of them did get the correspondence pretty quickly from Accelerator, but some of them had issues with contracts being left out um, of the spreadsheet because there were multiple contracts. Um, and so there was a lot, some obviously technical glitches, but also it's just not something that can be completed in eight days. Uh, some of our providers have hired temps to come in and work on this um, to, because they have 50 or 60 contracts and hundreds of budget lines that, or you know, staff lines that need to be filled in. Uh, you're also asking people to do this who are underpaid workforce, who don't get an adequate administrative overhead rate, uh, who are also filling out RFPs and meeting payroll. So it's not something that they can just take a staff person and stick it on for eight days. Um, and so that has been one of the big things that I think, you know, four to five weeks to get this turned around from most of these agencies is probably a more realistic time frame. So we're meeting that time frame now. Uh, but eight days, a couple of providers were able to turn it in, and they spent a significant amount of overtime um, and staff brain power to get it in within those eight days. So if, if you can give us a list of the things that, of the factors that providers are identifying as hindering their ability to submit the mm -hmm. information, I, I don't want to walk out of here thinking they're being irresponsible. They are not. Um, I have a, about 180 members, and I think about 179 have called me about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so one what, probably what, doesn't get a city contract. What are, what are the nuances that are, besides it's just time consuming and not yeah. e user friendly? So uh, is not, there someone from the administration still here, OMB? Yes? No? Whoa. Somebody's getting a call today. <laughs> Um, okay, so I think we need to um, provide for them that information as quickly as possible. So if there is a technical issue mm -hmm. with the system, that it be corrected. Yeah, so it's not so much, there's been, there, we have submitted a number of questions to OMB and individual providers have submitted a number of questions. The first thing I would say is that it definitely takes longer than eight days to fill out this form. Not that it's not user friendly without any technical glitches. We have providers who have hundreds of staff lines that need to be filled in and they can't just pull one staff person to work on it for five days. That's just not gonna happen, so I think that's one. Two, there were definitely <laughs> glitches that have been communicated to Accelerator. Um, I have to be honest, the city agency staff was not prepared for this. We, when providers received their spreadsheets, they of course went to their ACOs and contract managers who had never seen the spreadsheet, um, who understood the, the wage floor piece, but not the COLA piece. And so there was a lot of you know, conversation back and forth. There were contracts that were missing from certain spreadsheets. Some providers said that they didn't get the communication because email, while technology is great, is not perfect. Um, so, and there was a lot of confusion around, do they have to fill in the staff lines for every person under their contracts, just people under 1150? Um, they have vacant lines. What do they do about people that, you know, summer, summer youth um, programs, for example, they only have people for three months. So they might not have someone in the position. So there's a lot of back and forth to get these spreadsheets filled. And Accelerator have being the, the central point was great, but there was also no FAQ or anything that accompanied these documents, nor has one been released since um, to help providers muddle through. Okay. Uh, anybody else? You, a PWA, do you have any, your providers what, or your members? Yes. And thank you for the work on the worker cooperative. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> We are hearing largely exactly what Michelle is hearing. That it's not that the providers don't want the money. They're very appreciative. They're, you know, working through the process. There are just these administrative pieces that are difficult, especially um, when you're talking about smaller organizations who don't have the staff capacity um, to meet these quick turnaround times. So we know that a lot, many of our member agencies who have received um, the contract amendments are working on it, but they just don't have the staff time to get it turned around in the eight days. So they are hoping to meet this new kind of deadline of the next couple mm -hmm. of weeks that Michelle was mentioning. And the, no, no feedback? Um, I just wanted to underscore the fact that um, going in, neither uh, the contract providers in many cases nor the city 
had detailed information on the workers who were providing the city contract. Um, the city had never requested that information before. The city had never really needed wow. that information before. Um, and, and, and again, it, it, it reflects an indifference that the previous city administrations had toward this workforce. It's somebody else's responsibility. It's not the city's responsibility. So I think the fact that you've seen this initiative indicates that we're in a different age and there is a recognition that, that, that this is the city's indirect workforce that the city has responsibility for. And going forward in the new human service contracts, the providers will be providing the information not only on job titles and wages, but also on health benefits and pension uh, benefits, if any, and so on. So the city will have a better idea of what the compensation of this workforce is. Just very quickly to tag on to what James just said, we keep coming back to this idea of what is a good job, and a good job is not just wages. That is a huge piece of it, but it's not just that. It's also affordable health care. It's retirement. It's all these other pieces that make work uh, reasonable and work with your family and your other responsibilities. And so I encourage the council, thank you so much for your oversight on this issue and the wage piece. It's so needed. But also looking at these other pieces like affordable health care insurance that so many of the human services workers just don't have available to them right now. Um, let's see. This has been so helpful. Maybe we should have had you guys go first. This was great. <laughs> Um, just some really quick questions, um, Mr. Parrott, if we could start with you. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned eight, 15, to, oh wait, sorry, I want to welcome Council Members Deutsch and Crowley. Um, I know you had earlier um, uh, things you had to be at, so thanks so much for coming by, I really appreciate it. Um, you mentioned 15 to 18,000 full and part-time human service contract workers, and then another 50 or 50,000 or so workers benefiting from the 2.5 percent COLA. Um, is the 15 to 18,000 a subset of the 50,000? Because OMB only mentioned the 50,000. Well, uh, we didn't get together and sort of compare the latest of uh, calculations uh, for this workforce, but, but I'm thinking back to, to spreadsheets we were looking at in the spring mm -hmm. where the total workforce that we were intending to cover um, was about 60 to 65,000. Okay. And we were able to extend the program areas beyond the sort of core human service areas. So. Granted, those are not necessarily big contracts in criminal justice and the, and the small business services, but included in that are the, some of the DOE contracts that we hadn't, we hadn't included that workforce before. So right. I think, you know, again, because we don't have solid information to work from, these are guesstimates uh, yeah. at best based upon the survey that, the, that PV talked about OMB conducting uh, back in the spring. So. So I think, you know, this is the, the ballpark for the number of workers. So I think altogether, you know, the workers affected by the wage floor and the, and the COLA are going to be in the 60 to 65,000 range. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and then, uh, let's see, Michelle, you mentioned that uh, there about, you have about 200 providers, um, but OMB was talking about 800 providers. So can any of the three of you help me understand if, it, if they're not members of the Human Services Council? Um, I did hear a little bit of SBS and MACJ and um, DOE, but that can't make up the other 600. Yeah, so this is my favorite question. So, <laughs> so, this one's, so HSC has about uh, you know, 200 members under us, but we also have all of the federations and coalitions who have a significant amount of members. So uh -huh. HSC, our direct membership is under 200, but our reach is more about 2,000. Because if you factor in groups like FPWA who don't have dual membership, UJA mm -hmm. Federation, Catholic Charities, there's a lot of those groups who, uh, who tend to be smaller, who have just a few contracts, while we have more of the larger con contracting agencies. I mean, our, our organizations run the gamut. But that's 
that's how you get to about 800 is, um, you know, if you look, include, if you include some of the other coalitions, like New York Immigration Coalition, they obviously have a lot of groups who have a, a number of literacy and immigrant services contracts, Hispanic Federation, FPWA, mm -hmm. UJ Federation, uh, those groups. Thank you. Um, and um, Emily, for FPWA, so what are some of your providers that would fall under your coalition? So we have about 200 member organizations that run the gamut across the human services sector. So everything from um, working in se with seniors, early childhood education, housing and homeless services, domestic violence, everything that you can imagine under the uh, human services umbrella. So the two of us really want to know, are the worker co-ops going to get, oh no, because we <laughs> wouldn't do something, okay. Well, kidding aside, right? Um, I, a serious discussion about how do we deal with right. wage um, appropriate wages and work worker cooperatives as nonprofits might help us have that conversation in a more holistic way. Uh, workers in work owned businesses earn higher wages mm -hmm. than their counterparts in private traditional businesses. But um, in our conversation internally is how do we engage the health and human services um, arena in a conversation about how nonprofits as worker cooperatives can also be part of this larger issue about equity and appropriate wages for the work people do. Agreed. We'd love to have that conversation. Um, and then. Uh, so, Emily, you also mentioned that the goal would be to get to $15 an hour by FY18. So, if we're at 11.50 now and we're in FY16. Right. Um, so, what we had always said was $15 phased in, just because it tends to be more responsible to do it in a phased in manner. Yep. So, in our mindset, we were looking at 11.50 going to 13.30 the second year and then $15. Great. That's very helpful. So when we ask the administration for the cost, right. um, that's how we can peg it um, that way. Okay. And that's sort of consensus. Can I just add to that that there's also the important latter piece of that, that people who are making 15 or 14 now, we don't want human services jobs to become minimum wage jobs overnight. Uh, we're very concerned about that. We're already significantly low wage workers and so part of that phase in also needs to include how do you get the 16 to yep. 18 so that overnight you don't have a number of people all at $15. So explain that a little bit more does that that is that the 11 million dollars that the administration put in for career ladder is that what that affects or mm, no? No so so that it, it was five million I believe unless they increased it without Oh no! I didn't hear the, about the other six million. No, I'm really old. The five so million five for million. developing okay. a career ladder that would then, that would exist sector wide in the in the human services nonprofit sector and be funded by the city, that would provide access to education and training and the supports needed for counseling and child care to enable people to access the training and so on. Michelle is referring to what what economists sometimes refer to as the spillover wage effects so that if you raise everybody up to $15 an hour, yeah. the people who are close to or a little bit above 15 or even 16 or 17 uh, are, are very likely to expect and should, should be expecting some wage adjustment on their end mm -hmm. as well. So we need to, at this point, you know, nothing's been factored in for that. Um, so we need to start thinking about that, particularly as the wage levels rise uh, above um, where they are. So, and I guess I'd also like to address uh, how the world is different from when we started this campaign a year and a half ago. Um, we never saw $15 as a minimum wage, yeah. right? We saw $15 as something moving in the direction of a living wage for the human services sector. Um, fortunately, there has been progress around us in other spheres with the governor's proposal for a $15 minimum wage in fast food, and now extending that across the board to all sectors in, in New York State. Um, because of the importance of social services, for human services, uh, you know, the importance uh, 
to uh, of the services that are provided and the importance to all society of doing that and the fact that these are not unskilled workers or low skilled workers they're low paid they have lots of skills and they have more importantly they have a lot of commitment to what they do so we shouldn't see this as a minimum wage sector so our advocacy really needs to sort of put more emphasis on uh, good um, benefits uh, make real the career ladder opportunities so that workers can avail themselves of opportunities to to you know move up to acquire additional skills credentials and education and move up to better positions within within the sector or wherever for that matter um, and it's going to take additional resources to do that and because this is an indirect city workforce providing an essential service they're entitled to it we're all entitled to it right right um so then if we were thinking about what an FAQ would include, we would include in there, yes, give us the titles of the workers and their wages, even if they're making over $11.50 an hour, right? Because hypothetically, if we want to capture the spillover effect for the next installments, we would use right. this opportunity now, and is that their answer? Well, the more the pe the staff lines that are have to be included now are from people who make more than eleven. It's every staff line oh, under good. a city contract, so yes. they get the two point five percent. So they are documenting all of that information. Uh, so it's not just they're not just capturing the people who are under eleven fifty now. So hypothetically, when they do the the run for the thirteen thirty and the fifteen, they can capture what the impact will be on the workers right. making close to that wage. Um, and I'm sure you'll have thoughts about proportionally how much those wages should be increased by and what that number should be as well, right? Mm -hmm. We'll need to give the administration guidance on that. Sure. Yeah. Um, who got the five million for developing the career ladder and how's that going? Um, so the $5 million, um, so the development of the career ladder system is currently being housed by um, OLR, Office of Labor Relations. Um, our original vision for this money was a centralized education and training fund that would provide access to social service employees to access for higher education, um, re obtaining certifications, but also for a really critical support piece to allow those activities to happen. So we're talking about a workforce that is mainly women, many of them have children, and if you are at a job where you're earning $12 an hour, you are likely to have a second or third job in order to make ends meet, which makes it very difficult to go back to school, which is why the wage piece is really critical. But the support piece for the education and training fund is critical as well, because if you're going back to school, it's probably at night or on the weekends, and you need quality child care available to you at during those times in order to make that possible. So we envisioned the creation of this centralized education and training fund to have two pieces, a financial support piece, but also the a, a support piece for kind of life events that pop up that make it impossible to go back to school. Um, the five million dollars as we first imagine as first we first understood it was an initial investment to create that fund. Um, we now understand that they are um, looking at putting $2.5 million of that um, towards just the early childhood education uh, sect part of the sector, um, and then the other 2.5 for the remaining parts of the sector. That's not how we initially envisioned it, and we look forward to additional information about how that would actually be um, played out. Um, that said, that development of the education and training piece has been delayed because in, a, in essence it had to come second to determining who was actually included in the human services yep. sector. So that goes to some of the pieces that you heard from Michelle and from PV earlier about what programs and contracts were actually going to be included in this larger program. Now that we have that, we should be able to move forward with further defining the uh, right. career Right. It doesn't sound like we have it at all. Well, I mean, I, it sounds well, like we'll have it. <laughs> Well, it doesn't sound like they have it. They have 30% of it. So there, it sounds like they're going to have it by February at best. Um, and so I'm wondering, it's just sitting in OLR right now. Well, in that. so, so um, I'm not sure I, uh, we're on the same page here. I don't know that, that OMB needs to have all of the responses back from the 
providers in order to move forward on the career uh, ladder piece. Yeah, uh, so who, who do you recommend we talk to to gently nudge them along? Um, I would suggest um, OMB, for starters, because they certainly know where it's at, um, if, even if they're not directly in charge of developing it right now. Okay. I don't think so. I mean, I think... Who would you contact? Um, I'm, I'm guessing the first deputy mayor at this point. It would have been the deputy mayor for human services. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Um, any, anything? Do my colleagues have any other questions? I, you know, I think this career ladder conversation, and, and we had a joint hearing on the administration's workforce development strategy, yeah. a larger a plan that includes um, and the, the construction industries are, are very nervous about what that means for them and some certification for them being, I don't know, a good employer. I think it's the label that they would get. Uh, so we're, we're going to do another um, discussion about where are we with that workforce development strategy and how this career ladder um, strategy works in its way into that or how we work it into that uh, because we can't have parallel conversations and somewhere they don't meet. We, th this is all part of a much larger issue that requires all of these things to intersect and make sense if we're going to deal with the issue of wage, appropriate wages and, and people being able to earn a living in the city that they could still afford to live here. Regardless of what neighborhood, it troubles me that you know, in more affluent neighborhoods, people need to make more money so they could stay there. I think people need to make more money, period, regardless of where they live. Mm -hmm. um, and that's my only criticism of the United Way <laughs> report. Um, but um, I certainly hope to see you guys at, at that hearing and in that conversation as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call up the last panel. We have Amina Rouse from the Women's Center for Education and Career Advancement, Carmen Rivera, VIP Community Services, and Gregory Bender from uh, United Neighborhood Houses. Thanks so much for your patience, and thank you for coming to testify. And that's it for in terms of slips that I have for people who would like to testify, if there's anyone else. Um, please let the sergeant at arms know. Thank you. This one? Looks like it. Okay. Want to go first? You go first. I go first. Though. We <laughs> called three. She called three people. Where is yeah. the third party? Hello. Come. You don't have to. <laughs> um, and while we're waiting, I just want to thank um, Sarah Desmond, who was here earlier from Housing Conservation Coordinators, who submitted testimony regarding the self-sufficiency guidelines, and I appreciate that. And also, for the record, we had testimony from Lauren Miller uh, from the United Way of New York City. We're sorry they couldn't come, but we have their testimony. Okay, if I could ask the three of you um, to decide who to go first, or we can just start from left to right or right to left. Gregory, you you're definitely first? second, but uh, second. Right. if we could get that going, I'd appreciate it. Just introduce yourselves. Thank you. Yes. I'm, my name is uh, Carmen Rivera, and I am the AVP of Community and External Affairs at Community, VIP Community Services. Oh, I, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Chairs Rosenthal and Arroyo, uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on this very important topic. Uh, we, VIP Community Services, was established in 1974, and we are dedicated to changing lives and transforming our community in the Bronx. Uh, we service 10,000 clients a year. We develop affordable housing for families and single adults. Currently, we're, we maintain 18 sites that provide affordable, supportive, and transitional housing. We provide high-quality, comprehensive healthcare services 
to low-income and uninsured individuals, which include primary care at a federally qualified health center with a specialty in HIV treatment and prevention. We also uh, currently acquired license article number 31 for mental health services. VIP's most important resource is our trained and dedicated staff. We currently employ 250 staff across our sites, including 57 whose compensation is covered by New York City human service contracts. 57, yes. These staff provide a range of health care and social services to our clients, which include social workers, health care workers, counselors, care coordinators, and residential aides, as well as administrative staff. Just as our clients seek to gain self-sufficiency through the services VIP provides, so too do our staff rely on the compensation and benefits they receive from us in order to survive in our community and gain self-sufficiency for, them, for themselves and their families. While employees in human services fields in, uh, provide critical, sometimes life-saving support to communities most in need, their salaries are often barely enough to cover basic cost of living expenses, particularly in the New York City area. In fact, those who make the least are often the staff who have the most contact and direct impact on client care and outcomes. For this reason, VIP is thankful that Mayor de Blasio and this council approved a 2.5 cost of living adjustment and even more importantly, an 1150 hour wage floor for city human service contracts in the fiscal year 2016. These adjustments recognize that for too long, wages for workers in our field have been stagnant despite the continually rising cost of living in the city. Uh, beyond the financial burden, staff turnover due to low wages, and that's something that uh, I think Michelle mentioned in her testimony earlier, uh, staff turnover due to low wages also leads to instability for VIP's programs and our clients. Clients are able to most effectively achieve their goals when they can develop strong ongoing relationships with the staff and our programs. Turnover negatively impacts continuity of care and therefore client outcomes. VIP also incurs higher overtime costs when we have vacancies, as we cannot go without coverage in certain residential uh, sites uh, in, in our service areas. For those reasons, VIP encourages the council and the mayor to build on the recent gains by considering regular cost of living adjustments that keep human service providers salaries at a pace with the, commensurate with inflation and competitive with other low wage industries that are starting, that we, that are starting to see increased wage floors. The outcome will be more stable human services communities in New York City and will enable organizations like VIP to help more New Yorkers achieve healthy and successful lives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bender, I'm going to ask that you try to summarize yeah. your testimony. Um, just hit the high points. Sure. I won't, I won't read it all. Um, I'm Gregory Brender from United Neighborhood Houses. We are the Federation of the Settlement Houses. I actually just wanted to briefly respond to three things I heard in the hearing. Uh, first was, will providers actually do it or do they want to? And we've met with our member agencies many times, and the answer is yes. Even for those who have calculated that uh, actually implementing it will cost more than they're going to get, there is an incredibly strong desire to uh, see this workforce that has been uh, poorly treated receive the amount of money uh, that they deserve, which the second part I'll get to is that we don't think that's adequate. Uh, but the two other questions, the $4 uh, staffer that PV mentioned. I think that relates, and this is, I don't know from specifics, I don't know who said that, but my sense is that providers have been incredibly creative in how they fund positions. So you get, you know, something from here. So you could see, for example, a senior center director with a diff to contract is part-time. Um, but if you combine that with a NORC SSP contract from the state, um, so the city may be only funding essentially $4 of that contract, uh, four dollars per hour of that contract, but they'll be providing the others through state contracts through something else. Um, 
and I think it's just the the challenge that I know OMB, OLR, and all these other agencies are trying to look through in that human service contracts because we don't have a comprehensive system because providers have been saying what do my what does my community need and how do I pull together this this and this to make it happen? Um, you have numbers that are probably looking a little funky like that. Um, third, I remember you asking about four uh, Councilmember Arroyo about for profit providers, and I also remember. God, that must be five years ago, you questioning ACS very strongly about this at the original hearing on Early Learn. You were right then to say that um, the contracts should be um, put in 501c3s. I think you're still right. Unfortunately, ACS did not take your advice or ours. We had suggested the same thing, and there are uh, for-profit providers in that contract, probably others that I can't think of. Um, the main two points that we have in our testimony are about um, just that we're very grateful this is happening, we're very grateful to the council for your oversight, but that this is not enough to, to move people out of poverty. Uh, 1150 an hour to full-time wage is 23,000, that's below the, I was a 24,250 uh, poverty threshold for a family of four. Um, so we really do need to keep going, so we're really, really grateful to hear the council, um, all the other advocates talking about the need to move up to 15. Um, the other thing we wanted to really specifically address was sort of impact on programs and then looking at one area in particular, which was the early childhood. Um, the impact on programs throughout the sector means the turnover, as Michelle mentioned. It means, you know, particularly in areas where people are building relationships, um, those relationships have to be constantly reinvented, and that's, that's a real challenge. Um, where we've seen this really have a huge impact is the early childhood field where there's an incredible disparity between the teachers working in community-based organizations and those in the Department of Education. I have some stats on, on what those mean, but it, you know, in the immediate term, it's differences of 10,000. Um, if you've been at your job a long time, sometimes like 15 years, you're looking at $30,000 disparities um, in how much you're making for a job that actually even has longer hours. And we've already seen this drain of certified teachers um, in a survey conducted uh, by our colleagues at the Daycare Council of many of their members in early, early childhood where they found 69% of surveyed, surveyed agencies didn't had lost a certified teacher in the last two years since the implementation of pre-K. 76% um, of centers have vacancies and it takes about three to six months to fill them. So we're really seeing in the services that are, in the services that are there for the most low income families and children, um, a loss of qualified staff and you know, quite frankly, even as someone representing their employers, it's it's hard to blame them because they do need to make an honest wage to support their families. Mm -hmm. So thank you again for holding this hearing and for your really passionate advocacy on this, and we look forward to keep working with you. Oh, and one other thing, on the early childhood issue, I also submitted with our testimony a letter spearheaded by the Campaign for Children with over 100 um, provider and advocacy organizations calling on the city to take immediate action to achieve salary parity for the early childhood workforce. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, you answered my question. In fact, I was going to ask, do you want to submit more information about it? Here it is. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, Ms. Rouse, uh, my understanding is you're going to read a statement, which is fine, but I hope it's not this really it's long one. It's very long, so if you guys would rather me not act greatly appreciate that. <laughs> oh, don't feel nervous, but um, okay, well, that's fine. We have it for the record. Okay. Um, I just had one question then um, for, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Rivera. Yes. How many contracts, how many human service contracts does your agency have? We have several. We have several. Uh, we work with DHS. DHS <coughs> is our biggest city uh, city contract. And then what other agencies? I think it's OTADA, uh, Sabrina. OTADA. What's OTADA? Uh, the disability, disability, temporary disability. And that's the state. Agency. Yes. That's state. So do you yeah, have any other city? State. You can get a list. No, here's why I'm asking. I'm it happy doesn't to really bring matter. that information, but I don't have it with me. It doesn't really matter. This is very helpful. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, because in your testimony, you start to explain the complexity 
of filling out these forms. Uh -huh. um, actually, what you just said further <laughs> explains it. Um, but you mentioned that you have 250 staff across the sites, including 57 whose compensation is covered Correct. by the human the, service and those contract. And 57 employees are covered under the city contracts. And so it's for those 57 employees that you're filling out the HHS That's accelerator correct. form. That's correct. That's right. correct. Okay. And, um, our, and our forms have already been sent in. Thank you. For <laughs> well, it sounds like you, you're working with an extraordinary person. Perhaps she's in this room, Ms. Shulman, yes, yes, yes. who gives you a lot of good help. All right, yes. Oh, Council Member Miller has joined us. Thank you so much for coming here. Um, does anyone else have any questions, or else I think I'm going to call the hearing to a close. <laughs> Well, I, <laughs> you made it in just under the wire. Uh, as we sum up, I just want to, as always, thank you, um, our providers and the public. Um, it's my favorite part of the hearings all, always to hear from our nonprofit organizations and our public to hear your side of the story because usually we get to different pictures although at this hearing that was not necessarily the case and, and I want to thank OMB for that. Um, we're usually hearing completely different um, opposite stories from, from the public and our providers and, and I want to thank you for the work that you all do in our communities because without you we would fail so miserably in our challenge to serve people in need. And we have many New Yorkers that benefit from the services that you provide and that you should get paid for that work appropriately. And that you should not have to worry about where $15 an hour is gonna come from uh, so that we can um, raise the floor on the minimum and then worry about how we're gonna do the guys that are making more than 15. I think that's a challenge that we are all capable of uh, taking on and, and being creative about getting it done. Um, in my opening statement, I said this is not a debate with the administration about the law that they have to adhere to as it relates to contracts. It's about how do we deal with the need for the city not to be the largest, largest employer of poverty wages that we know of in the city. That, in my mind, is unacceptable. I don't... I don't care what anybody has to say about that. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your collaboration in this conversation. Well, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just want to echo what Councilmember Arroyo just had to say, and I look forward to. We've learned so much today um, from the providers, people, uh, you know, right in the city providing the services, hands on. Thank you for your work. Um, but also to OMB and to the Human Services Council and to FPWA and Fiscal Policy Institute who's helping to bring all this together. I share your goal of tr our trying to get to $15 an hour. It sounds like it's just a matter of figuring out the process of how to do it so it doesn't interrupt or get in the way of um, getting additional funds from the state and the federal government, which certainly we, we I feel very strongly they need to do their share. Um, but the sooner we can get to $15 an hour for all city workers, the better. Uh, so I thank you so much for collaborating on this hearing. Always a pleasure. I call this hearing to a close. Thank you.